The Postscript to the Manifesto by Theodore Kaczynski, taken as an excerpt from the book Technological Slavery, published by Farrell House, read by Russell Stroud. The effort that goes into recording these sessions is entirely supported by donations from the listener. Go to ko-fi.com slash Radio Russell to support the reader. To hire me for your work, go to stroudvoice.com. That's S-T-R-O-U-D voice.com. As always, this is presented purely for academic, educational, and informational purposes. I do not condone the actions of Ted Kaczynski, a.k.a. the Unabomber. The manifesto, Industrial Society and Its Future, has been criticized as unoriginal, but this misses the point. The manifesto was never intended to be original. Its purpose was to set forth certain points about modern technology in clear and relatively brief form, so that those points could be read and understood by people who would never work their way through a difficult text, such as Jacques Ellul's Technological Society. The accusation of unoriginality is in any case irrelevant. Is it important for the future of the world to know whether Ted Kaczynski is original or unoriginal? Obviously not. But it is indeed important for the future of the world to know whether modern technology has us on the road to disaster, whether anything short of revolution can avert that disaster, and whether the political left is an obstacle to revolution. So why have critics, for the most part, ignored the substance of the arguments raised in the manifesto and wasted words on matters of negligible importance, such as the author's putative lack of originality and the defects of his style? Clearly the critics can't answer the substance of the manifesto's reasoning, so they try to divert their own and others' attention from its arguments by attacking irrelevant aspects of the manifesto. One doesn't need to be original to recognize that technological progress is taking us down the road to disaster, and that nothing short of the overthrow of the entire technological system will get us off that road. In other words, only by accepting a massive disaster now can we avoid a far worse disaster later. But most of our intellectuals, and here I use that term in a broad sense, prefer not to face up to this frightening dilemma because, after all, they are not very brave, and they find it more comfortable to spend their time perfecting society's solutions to problems left over from the 19th century, such as those of social inequality, colonialism, cruelty to animals, and the like. I haven't read anything that's been written on the technology problem, and it's possible that the manifesto may have been preceded by some other text that expounded the problem in equally brief and accessible form. But even so, it would not follow that the manifesto was superfluous. However familiar its points may be to social scientists, those points still have not come to the attention of many other people who ought to be aware of them. More importantly, the available knowledge on this subject is not being applied. I don't think many of our intellectuals nowadays would deny that there is a technology problem, but nearly all of them decline to address it. At best, they discuss particular problems created by technological progress, such as global warming or the spread of nuclear weapons. The technology problem as a whole is simply ignored. It follows that the facts about technological progress and its consequences for society cannot be repeated too often. Even the most intelligent people may refuse to face up to a painful truth until it has been drummed into their heads again and again. I should add that, as with the manifesto, no claim of originality is made for this book as a whole. The fact that I've cited authority for many of the ideas about human society that are presented here shows that those ideas are not new, and probably most of the other ideas too have previously appeared somewhere in print. If there is anything new in my approach, it is that I've taken revolution seriously as a practical proposition. Many radical environmentalists and green anarchists talk of revolution, but as far as I'm aware, none of them have shown any understanding of how real revolutions come about, nor do they seem to grasp the fact that the exclusive target of revolution must be technology itself, not racism, sexism, or homophobia. A very few serious thinkers have suggested revolution against the technological system, for example, Ilul in his Autopsy of the Revolution. But Ilul only dreams of a revolution that would result from a vaguely defined, spontaneous spiritual transformation of society, and he comes very close to admitting that the proposed spiritual transformation is impossible. I, on the other hand, think it plausible that the preconditions for revolution may be developing in modern society, and I mean a real revolution, not fundamentally different in character from other revolutions that have occurred in the past. But this revolution will not become a reality without a well-defined revolutionary movement guided by suitable leaders, 
leaders who have a rational understanding of what they are doing, not enraged adolescents acting solely on the basis of emotion. The preceding was Postscript to the Manifesto by Theodore Kaczynski. Read by Russell Stroud. This work is released as Creative Commons and is supported by donations. Go to ko-fi.com slash Russell to donate.